What's going on, my ASVAB party people? Anderson here, your ASVAB coach, and let's have a little conversation about paragraph comprehension. You know, do you feel like paragraph comprehension is one of those subjects that, hey man, you know, just haven't studied it that much, and it just feels like there's no rhyme or rhythm to it. It feels random, it feels like you're not really sure what to do when you see these questions, and that's okay to feel that way. But in this video, what I'm gonna show you is how there's actually a strategy that you could follow for every type of paragraph comprehension question and give you tips and strategies to study with and to take with you to test it. So again, I'm Anderson, your ASVAB coach, and in this video, again, we're gonna be going over paragraph comprehension. We wanna know our enemy, we gotta know the format, we gotta know the different types of paragraph comprehension questions, we need to know the strategies and the extra test taking tips. So get ready to tackle this, let's ace the ASVAB, and let's get right to it. First things first, we gotta know our enemy. What is the paragraph comprehension and why is it being tested on the ASVAB? So here's the thing, for you, for your purposes here, you need to know that the paragraph comprehension, it tests you on your ability to interpret context. Can you read a paragraph or a passage or an excerpt and understand what was going on? Can you draw conclusions, accurate ones? Can you make accurate statements based off of what you read? You know, this is very important, especially in the military, because you want to make sure that you can follow orders and directions when given to you. So with that said, here's what the paragraph comprehension really does. It's here to gauge your knowledge of language and your ability to critically assess what you read. On top of that, your ability to draw conclusions from that information. So over here now, knowing your enemy also looks like this. How many questions and how much time are you dealing with? So typically in the paragraph comprehension, what you're going to see is you're going to have 11 questions to deal with, 22 minutes total for those 11 questions. So what does that mean? Well, if we have 22 minutes and 11 questions, what that means is we have about two minutes per question right there. And so that's really useful information. Why is that useful? Well, think of it like this. If I told you that you're taking a test right now and I didn't tell you how much time you get per question and you have a full eight sentence word problem to deal with the first question, you're sitting here like, okay, let's try this thing out. And you end up taking, let's go ahead and say seven, eight, nine minutes for that question, not knowing that you still have 12 more questions to go and now you only have three minutes left. That's not fun, right? It's not fun at all. So knowing your enemy allows you to gauge the time that you're taking to answer a question and to be able to tell whether or not it's time to just move on from that question. Very important to do, to be able to do that. So we get about two minutes per question. And so knowing that allows you again to understand whether or not you're taking too much time on a particular question. And if you just need to guess and move on. And before we continue, one of the main frustrations that so many people have with the ASVAB is not knowing what to study and how to study to begin with. So if you're one of those people that can do a good job, if everything's lined up for you, then go ahead and join our program. We have all the classes, all the recordings, all the courses with practice questions, with videos, and you can text me all the way up until you pass. So that's how it works. It's very simple, straightforward, and it gets you to the score and the job you want. Check out the link in the description of this video to learn more and sign up now. So moving forward here, let's go ahead and talk about the types of paragraph comprehension questions. This is really exciting here because look, if you know the types of questions that you're gonna be dealing with, guess what? then you can prepare for those types of questions, especially the more common ones, and really put yourself in a good position to succeed. Now, who doesn't want that, right? So let's go ahead and go over these common types of questions that you'll see on the paragraph comprehension. Now, these are not the only types that you'll see. Um, you will see a few other types, but they're not gonna appear every single time you take the test. So first off, the most, the most popular type of question right here is inferencing factual. So right there, Inferencing factual, this is your most common type of question. It's a pretty versatile type of question as well. So here's some examples. You've seen examples of questions like, oh, we have, uh, you know, which of the following can be inferred from the passage? We also have, okay, the passage infers or implies all of the following except, or the main idea of the passage is this, or according to the passage, pineapples are a, and they can say fruit, vegetable, whatever, right? So inferencing factual questions basically require you to use the information from the passage to draw some sort of conclusion. That's pretty much what you're doing here. And now there's something very important that I should mention. 
for every single type here. Write this down. For every single type of paragraph comprehension question, you need to make sure that you are only using what the passage is giving you. Again, only use what the passage tells you. Don't draw your own conclusions thinking that you, know, you can assume certain things. You, know, you need a reason to be able to assume certain things and the passage needs to lead you in that direction. So remember this, we're gonna go over all five of these, then we're gonna go over examples of each one. That way, again, you can really feel this out and understand this and move forward in the right way. So inferencing factual again, pretty much asking you to find the best fit answer. Next up, we have sequence of events. Sequence of events questions. Pretty much these types of questions, these are questions where you have to order the events of the passage, either start to finish or finish to first. Typically it goes from start to finish in chronological order, but know that you're gonna have to look at the passage and really again, understand the order of the events. And I'm gonna give you some tips for this coming up soon as well. Next sentence questions, these are arguably some of the most annoying types of questions here. Next sentence, typically what you have to do here is you have to go ahead and, oh, the passage is given to you, but they don't give you the last sentence. And so it's gonna be up to you to pick the answer that best fits the passage as the next sentence. Again, I'll give you more tips on this coming up soon. Next up, we are going to have tone questions. Tone questions are pretty much having you identify what the mood, the style, the vibe is of the text. You know, how is this text being, uh, being given? How is this being uh, portrayed? Okay. And so again, more on that in a bit. And then lastly, what we have over here, I think I used all my colors. I absolutely did. So I can go ahead and switch it up, whatever. I'll go back to purple. And then we have quote questions. So quote questions, basically they'll give you a quote, whether it's a saying, a phrase, or an idiom, or a quote from a text and you're gonna to have to interpret it. You're gonna to have to give a, a very accurate interpretation of what that quote means. And again, I'm here to help you out with these. We're gonna go over examples for all of these types, but I do wanna mention before we continue that right over here, inferencing factual, this is your most common type of question. By far, this is your most common type of question. All right, so on the ASVAB, you can expect at least half of them being inferencing factual, and then maybe you'll see one or two of each of these, maybe. But you'll see at least half of them be your inferencing factual because it's so expansive, right? Main ideas, can you inference this? What conclusions, what facts? There's a lot of different ways you can phrase that. And so let's get into some overall tips, okay? Let's go over some overall tips. You need to know this because if you are not on the same page as uh, the other test takers that are scoring high, well, then you're not going to score high yourself. So here are some tips for paragraph comprehension. Number one, always read the question first. I don't care who you are. I don't care how confident you are. If you are not, if you don't know what you're walking into, if you don't know why you're reading a passage, it's gonna be very hard to read through the information, really get it all and take it all in, and then understand exactly what you're supposed to do with it once you're done. If you know what the question is, for example, if they say, hey, uh, what type of a plant is a ficus? And then you go to the passage and you read, well, what I'm looking for is information about a ficus and what type of plant it is. So that's what you want to do. Reading the question first gives you the idea of what you need to target in that passage. And by doing that again, you give yourself that advantage of knowing what you're looking for. So always read the question first. There is no exception to that. Next up, you need to go straight to the passage with these types. When it comes to next sentence, tone, and quote questions, you go straight to the passage. So again, I'm gonna give you some tips for each individual type coming up soon in a bit, so pay, you know, be patient there. But when it comes to next sentence, tone, and quote, the reason that you should not read the answer choices before reading the passage is simply because of this. Next sentence and quote questions are designed to trick you. They're designed to trick you. There are going to be answer choices that sound like they fit. They're going to sound really nice. They're going to sound like they make sense. But the problem is this. It's not about picking the answer that makes the most sense. It's about picking the answer that is basically going to represent the passage the best. Not the one that makes the most sense, but the one that fits the passage the best. And that's what gets so many people on the paragraph comprehension. You have to pay attention there. Again, it is not about what you know. It's about what the passage is saying. So again, 
always stick to what the passage is telling you. And number two, you need to make sure that the answer choices are supported by the passage. Again, it's not about what you know. You cannot bring what you know into this. And so for sequence of events questions for these types, you go straight to the answers. Again, for sequence of events, straight to the answers because the answers will again give away the order of what you're doing. So with that said, coming up now, what we're going to do here is we are going to go over tips for each specific type of paragraph comprehension question, along with an example or two of each. So let's go ahead, dive in first with inferencing factual. Let's go. And look, I know how awesome it is to watch these videos, but how much better would it be to actually sit in a live Zoom class with me, being able to answer your questions and show you how to get things done back to back to back? I got your back. Go ahead and join our program trial. It's free for a full week. I am so confident that it'll help you raise your score that I'm not even requiring a credit card for you to sign up. All you have to do is confirm your email and phone number and you're good to go. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead, click the link in the description or text trial to 833-321-0182. And I'll see you there, my ASVAB party people. Let's raise that score. Inferencing factual. Again, the most common type of paragraph comprehension question on the ASVAB. So inferencing factual, again, it, what it does here is it's asking you to pretty much support the answer with statements from the passage. What is best supported? And so first things first, always read the question first. And this is going to be the same tip for all types of questions. You want to be able to identify that you're dealing with an inferencing factual question. And now beyond that, think of it like this. When it comes to inferencing factual, if the answer choices are pretty short, it's actually OK to go ahead and read those answer choices, um, because if you read the answer choices, you might have a better idea as to what information you want to go ahead and kind of shift through. Now, um, if the answers are longer, then just start with the passage. Again, this one's pretty fluid. You can go back and forth nice and easy here without being too worried. Now, here's the thing. You need to be able to look out for trick answers. You got to look out for trick answers because um, the thing is like some answers might be common knowledge. You know, they one of the answer choices could be, you know, uh, you uh, if you pour water on something, it becomes wet. Well, here's the thing, you know, yeah, that's common knowledge, but if the passage isn't even talking about that or implying that or cluing to that, then it's going to be an incorrect answer. So there's plenty of examples where you can have a truthful statement as an answer, but it would be incorrect as a choice. Because again, inferencing factual is about what the passage is saying, not about what you personally know. Biggest tip I can give here. All right. So only use the information given in the passage to answer. I cannot, I cannot stress this enough right over there. I cannot stress this enough. And so let's go over two example questions. First one is going to be just a basic inferencing factual. And the second one is going to be a variation of it called an exception question. So we're going to go over both right now. Let's go ahead and get started here. Here's the first one. All right. So this is how the average ASVAB student typically does this. Fully grown frogs have the ability to avert their... No, remember, what we're looking for here, right here, which of the following claims is supported by the passage? That's what you're looking for. Which of the following claims is supported by the passage? So here we go. All right. Now, the answer choices, they're pretty long, not you know, kind of longer. They're not like two or three words. So I'll just go ahead and read the passage go to the choices and kind of go back and forth. Again, you have two whole minutes here, so you do have enough time to probably read the passage two or three times and still kind of go back and forth with the choices. You've got enough time. And if you don't feel that way right now, then you need to practice your reading skills. So get to that. So here we go. Fully grown frogs have the ability to avert their stomachs. This means that their stomach comes out of their mouths, turning inside out to dump the contents of their meal out. Following this, the frogs have a hardwired neurological response to lift an arm and brush off their stomach to clear it of food. Things I didn't know for 100. Wow, that's actually pretty interesting. So let's go ahead and see which of these answer choices again is supported by the passage. A, tadpoles cannot avert their stomachs. Okay, did we even talk about tadpoles here? No, but where can we imply that at all if, if we can? Well, over here, we see that the passage, so here we're talking about tadpoles, here it mentions specifically fully grown frogs have the ability to avert their stomachs. So why would we say fully grown frogs? Why don't we just say frogs in general? 
right? Why don't we just say frogs? So this is where you can infer or imply perhaps that, yeah, if we're talking about fully grown frogs and not tadpoles or adolescent frogs, just only, you know, just as fully grown frogs, it's very specific. I think A might be the answer here. Because yeah, if you're saying that the adults can do this, that implies that the youth probably can't. So let's keep that there just in case. Let's go to B. So frogs voluntarily brush their stomachs off after averting them. So we see that right there, brush their stomachs off. I am sure we saw that before, right here. Brush off their stomach. But here's the problem. This says voluntarily. Again, this is just one word. It's just one word in the answer choice that makes this wrong. Here we see it says voluntarily, but over here it says hardwired neurological response. So if it's a hardwired neurological response, that is not voluntary, that is involuntary. That happens regardless of whether the frog wants to or not. So B, out. We for sure know it's not the answer. So notice what I'm doing. I'm not only looking to support the correct answer, I'm looking to deny all of the incorrect answers. And so while you practice, definitely something you wanna do, you absolutely wanna make sure that you can look at these incorrect answers and say it is wrong because of A, B, and C, blah, blah, blah. You want to. C, so C, stomach aversion is necessary for frogs after they ingest toxins. Okay, so let's go ahead and read through this. Where do we mention toxins? Uh, their stomach comes out of their mouths, dumping the contents, following this, this is what happens. Nowhere in this do we talk about them ingesting toxins and this being a way for them to stay alive after they ingest toxins. It doesn't mention that at all. Now, is it possible that that's a factual statement? Oh yeah, very possible this is actually true in the real world. Very true, very possible. But the statement is not supported by the passage. Again, it's about what the passage supports, not about what you personally know. D, instead of digesting food, frogs will avert their food. Where does it say that instead of digesting? Mm, no, this does not talk about them uh, doing this instead of digesting. No, 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 no. The passage does not say that at all. And so therefore, we're able to infer or imply that A is the answer for two reasons mainly. One, we were able to prove that B, C, and D, right over here, incorrect. So A is the only one left, technically. But the other way to think about it is this. Remember, the first sentence clearly starts off with saying fully grown frogs. And so a tadpole, being a baby frog, basically, hey, if you're saying specifically, if you are naming fully grown frogs can do this, then we can imply that the non-fully grown frogs probably can't. And so we're able to support that here, and we're good. Now let's go ahead and check out another question here. Let's go ahead and check out inferencing factual, but this is an exception question. Now, what is an exception question again? Read here. So it says right here, all of the following can be implied from the passage, except, except. So here's what that means. This means that three choices are good or supported. The so three choices are supported and one choice is not supported. The so one choice not supported right here. So what that means is we need to find the choice that is actually not supported from the passage. That's what that means. So again, when you say, oh, well, the passage implies all the following except, find the one that's not true or not supported. So here we go. We have uh, pretty lengthy answers here, so that's okay. I'll go ahead and just start by reading the passage. And again, if you need to go back and forth, feel free. Totally fine. Let's get to it. Before electricity, American cold storage systems were essentially ice and straw packed tightly underground. As an example, in Jamestown, Virginia, there was an old seven foot pit discovered and believed to be modeled after an English style ice pit. It's pretty cool, sounds good. So let's go ahead and go through A, B, C, and D. Let's see which ones are supported versus not supported. Let's see what we have. A, electricity is not necessary to store items in the cold. That's supported actually. Before electricity, so let's go ahead and highlight some things here. Again, electricity, not necessary to store items in cold. Before electricity, the cold storage systems were essentially ice and straw packed tightly underground. So again, electricity was not necessary here. 
ice and straw, not a refrigerator, you know, not any fancy machines. So here, this is supported. This is supported. Now remember, because it's supported, and this is an exception question, this is not gonna be the answer. We're looking for the choice that is not supported. So let's check out B here. People used to store meat underground to keep it frozen. Okay, sounds good, so let's see here. Before electricity, we would pack it underground. As an example, there was an old seven foot pit discovered to be, uh, discovered and believed to be modeled after an English style ice pit. Okay, so we can absolutely imp uh, uh, imply that people used to store meat underground because, you know, obviously, what do we eat, right? You know, what do we need to keep frozen to keep from spoiling? So that would make sense that that would be implied. But here's where B is going to be the answer, actually. Here's why. Look at this little detail right here. Frozen. Frozen. The, did we see or say that these uh, these pits, you know, these ice pits freeze foods or keep the food cold? Ah, so here's the thing. You know, ice doesn't freeze other things. So ice is at, you know, freezing temperature and you use ice to make things colder. You don't use ice to freeze things. No, you need a refrigerator for that. But you see here, cold storage systems, essentially ice and straw packed tightly underground. Nothing here tells you that these ice pits actually froze your food. Whoa. And so if you don't believe me, don't worry. Let's go ahead and go to C and D. This is meant to keep the food cold, not frozen. So it's just one little detail that we do need to, again, make sure we're looking at. Take a look at C here. The English may have influenced the ice pit found in Jamestown, Virginia. So here we go. As an example, in Jamestown, Virginia, there's an old seven foot pit discovered and believed to be modeled after an English style ice pit. This right there is supported. This is absolutely supported as well. So that's not gonna be the answer because it is supported. And then lastly, ice pits can be made underground. Yeah, sounds good. There was an old seven uh, doo -doo -doo over here, right there, packed tightly underground. Yeah, ice pits can be stored underground or can be made underground, absolutely. So, yep. D wouldn't work because it, again, is supported. And so again, by process of elimination and by proof, yeah, B is going to be the answer here. Because again, the ice pit does not keep the food frozen, it keeps the food cold. Cold and frozen are two different things. And so with that, there you have it for inferencing factual. Now let's go ahead and take a look at sequence of events questions next. All right, so let's go ahead, let's get into sequence of events questions. So. Sequence of events questions, pretty much again, they have you align the story of the passage and you list the order of the events from start to finish right there, nice and easy. So here are some notes that we need to make sure we pay attention to. Right here, always read the question first. I think that goes without saying at this point, read the dang question first, all right? Then next, the correct answer will be the one that represents the correct chronicle, chronological order of the events. Can't believe I mispronounced that the correct chronological order of the events described in the passage. So you need to look out for some specific words because sometimes they'll give you dates, right? They'll give you months, days of the week, things like that. But there are other words that you really need to pay attention to. And that's gonna be words like until, or before, or afterwards, or since, or next, or finally. Those types of words, those transition words, those affect the chronology of the passage. You've got to pay attention to those, not just the dates, but also those, those date reference words. You've got to make sure you know those too. And so here's the thing. Here's my tip. When you're doing sequence of events questions, go straight to the answers. Go straight to the answers. You're going to underline the first part of each answer because, again, the sequence of events, if they're answer choices, the first part of every answer is technically the first event of that answer. So if you can go to the passage and say, okay, look, here are my choices. This says event A happened first, event A happened first, event B happened first, event B happened first. If it's at A, A, B, B, guess what happens? When you go to the passage and you look through it and you're like, oh, event B actually happened before event A. So event B happens first. Guess what you can do? You can eliminate those first two choices because those first two choices said that event A happened first. So you can get rid of both of those because you know B started first. And so now, if you run out of time, you can guess between C and D and move on nice and easy. So 
Here we go. Again, we're going to continue. We're going to start with the first part of each answer. Continue with the next part of each answer until you have the answer that represents the correct chronological order. So what would I be if I didn't take you through an example? So let's go ahead. Let's try this out. We have a lot of text here. So hopefully you're using a computer to go ahead and read this, but I will zoom in just a little bit here just to give us some more space. Right there is the best I can do. So let's go ahead and let's try this out. According to the passage, which of the following sequence of events is accurate? Sounds good. Which of the following sequence of events is accurate? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and highlight the first part of each answer choice. We're gonna go straight to the answers. Here we go. We've got the Civil War began. Here, the Civil War began. The Civil War began and the Civil War began. So with that said, what can we imply or infer happens first? The Civil War began, right? <laughs> yeah, the Civil War absolutely began first. All of these answer choices say it. So that must be the first event that happens. So we can ignore that actually. We can go to the next part now. Up next, we see that we have the Revenue Act of 1861, the Revenue Act of 1861. Then we have over here, we have Congress enacted a flat rate federal income tax, and then Congress enacted a flat rate federal income tax. So let's go ahead and erase these. This is really what we're looking at first. So which happened first, the Revenue Act of 1861 or the federal income tax flat rate? Which one of those happens first? Now we'll go to the passage and we'll see which one of those it is. So here. In 1894, Congress enacted a flat rate federal income tax. Whoa, there it is right there. 1894, flat rate federal income tax. There we go. Now, that doesn't mean that this happened first. It just means that we have a date for it, and now we need to figure out when the Revenue Act happened, so that way we can go ahead and pick which one happens. So here, next. Because it was a direct tax not divided with construction of the population of each state, the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional the following year. Before that, the first and only income tax in the United States was the Revenue Act of 1861, which was used to fund the Civil War and repealed about a decade later. Ah, sounds good. So, what we see here, okay, it says the Revenue Act of 1861, let me be specific here. The Revenue Act of 1861 was repealed And so was it repealed before the federal income tax? Was it repealed before then? Well, let's go ahead and look at the details here because we see here, again, before that, the first and only was the Revenue Act of 1861, repealed about a decade later. So that's really the big piece of information we wanna look at right there, repealed about a decade later. So what is a decade? A decade is 10 years. So if, it's, if it was enacted in 1861, well, what's 1861 plus 10 years? Because again, it says it's going to be, it was repealed 10 years later. That's 1871-ish, about that time. So what happened first, 1871 or 1894, right? So it had to have been the Revenue Act being repealed first, and so it could not be these. It can't. It can't. The, the, it was repealed first. And so up next, what do we have? We have the Supreme Court rules flat tax unconstitutional. And then over here we see that Congress enacted a flat rate federal income tax. So which one of these happens next? I don't care about these anymore. Don't care about them at all because they've already been deemed wrong. So with that said, let's take a look here. The Supreme Court file, uh, rules flat tax unconstitutional or Congress enacted a flat rate federal income tax. Which one happens first? Let's go here. So here it says, because it was a direct tax not divided with consideration of the population of each state, the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional the following year. So ruled it unconstitutional the following year. What do you mean the following year? Oh, that's right. It got enacted in 1894. So this was in 1895. So ruling it unconstitutional was in 1895. That's the year that they did that. Now, when did Congress enact the federal, the, the flat rate federal income tax? 
Well, 1894. 1894, right? They had to enact it before they repealed it. They had to enact it before they repealed it. And so therefore, A is incorrect. And so the correct answer here is B. Boom. Right there. Notice how we're using a process of elimination. I took this one a little slow for you, and that's okay. But remember, you go through the first event in each answer, see which one of those happens first. In this case, they were all the same, right? They were all the same. So we treated that with just credence and we just moved forward. And then from there, we saw that, oh, the, the, this event did not happen next. So both of those answers are gone. And so it's gonna be one of these two. And then we saw the next event and we keep going and going and going in that way. That's how you handle it. That's an example of sequence of events. So with that said, you know, we, we do have more practice in our program with all of the different types of questions that you'll see here today. So the ASVAB All Access program is something that you're gonna to wanna to learn about. And if you, you wanna learn more about it, make sure to find the link in the description of this video or the page that you're on to learn more about it. But with that said, let's go ahead, let's move it forward here to sequence, not sequence of events, excuse me. We're gonna move it on to the next type of question here for PC. Let's get to it. Hey, 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 really quick before we continue, if you're watching this, you've likely have already been to one of my classes and if you haven't been to one of my classes, remember to check that schedule. The link is right up there and in the description of this video. That way you can understand when my free classes are and my access program classes are. That way you can keep raising your score, knowing what topics we're doing and get the job you want. So again, click there or in the description to see when the classes are and join one for free. I'll see you there, my party people. Let's get back to the action. And now we're at next sentence questions. Arguably, again, the most annoying type of question that you'll see on the paragraph comprehension. And I agree with you. I'm with you right there if you believe the same. But we need to first understand our enemy, as always. So no matter what, remember, I'm going to sound repetitive here. Read the dang question first. We're always reading the question first. Right over here. Always read the question. Right there. Don't overlook it. Do not overlook it. So remember this. When it comes to next sentence questions, what you're trying to do is you're trying to pick the sentence in the choices here that pretty much does three things. One, we have to make sure that it follows the main idea. So right over here, follows the main idea, follows the tone, and what could follow the last sentence? Basically, can we add on to the story in a meaningful way? So are we preserving the tone of the passage? Are we stating the next sentence in the same way that the information was stated in the passage? Is the main idea of the theme still the same? And does it add on to the last sentence in a meaningful way? That's what you wanna know. That's what the next sentence, the correct one or the best one will be showing. Now remember this, they say which of the following would best or which of the following would most likely come next in the paragraph or in the passage. The key phrase here is most likely. So there could be two answers that seem like they could fit, but only one of them is the strongest answer. And that's why this is slightly subjective. In a way, it can feel that way. And that's why some people have trouble with this type of question. So allow me to take you through. Again, remember this. Go straight to the passage. Do not go to the answer choices. Those choices, again, some of them might sound good. Two of them, three of them are probably going to sound like they make sense. But if you do not know what you're doing, and if you go straight to the answers first, you're going to get tricked immediately. You're going to feel like one of them works, and then you get stuck. So remember that we have to choose the answer that best continues the passage, not anyone that best continues it or continues it at all, but the best one. So let's go ahead and get right into an example here. Let's go ahead and go. So the question reads, because you have to read the question, which of the following sentences would most likely come next in the paragraph? Sounds good. So remember, don't read the answers first, read the passage. If you need to read the passage two, three, or four times, completely fine. Do not put yourself in a compromised position by going ahead and seeing, okay, also he was the first Canadian to walk in space. Oh, that sounds like it would make sense. Okay, here we go. Chris Hatfield, a Canadian astronaut, released his first, and I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in just a little bit here for my party people using phones. So Chris Hatfield, a Canadian astronaut, released his first ever music album. This would be an unworthy mention if the album wasn't recorded while he was in orbit. That's pretty cool. Hatfield spent 144 days at the International Space Station recording his 11 original songs for his appropriately titled album, Space Sessions, Songs for a Tin Can. So here's one suggestion that I have for you. 
when you're practicing for PC, paragraph comprehension, it's a really good idea to read the passage as if you're interested in it. Read it to get the information. Read it to actually understand what's going on. Don't just read it word by word like Chris Hatfield, a Canadian astronaut, released his first ever music album. There's a very big difference between reading it like that and going, Chris Hatfield, a Canadian astronaut, released his first ever music album. And if you're not able to read in that way, if you're not able to read it with the emotion, with the tone and the main idea in mind, then you need to practice. There's no way around it. The ASVAB will expose you if you're not ready to tackle questions like that. So with that said, we read the passage. I'm going to read it again. And that's okay. You have enough time for it. Remember, try to get the main idea, the tone, and then what can we do to build off of the last sentence? So what is this about? Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut, he released his first ever music album. So Chris Hadfield and music. This would be an unworthy mention if the album, the music, wasn't recorded while he was in orbit. Space. Astronaut. Chris Hadfield. Okay, cool. Hadfield spent 144 days on the ISS, the space station. So we're talking about Chris Hadfield. We're talking about space. We're talking about music. That's what we're talking about. And we're speaking of this in a somewhat formal way. We're talking about Chris Hadfield in the third person. We're not talking to the audience. The passage is not speaking to me. The passage is giving information, spreading information about Chris Hadfield. So with that said, um, and then the name of the album was called Space Sessions, Songs, or a Tin Can. So again, what I got from this is we're talking about Chris Hadfield, space, and music. The tone of the passage, well, they're giving this, you know, this information here in the third person. This is not talking directly to anybody or me as an audience member. It's just talking in general. And then the last statement here, okay, uh, he recorded his 11 original songs, and the title was Space Sessions, Songs for a Tin Can, still talking about that music. So again, the next sentence is going to have something to do with Chris Hadfield being an astronaut, something about space and music, has to kind of be in that ballpark. So now that I'm understanding what I'm looking to get out of this question, or what I'm expecting to see as a good answer, now let's go ahead and see these answer choices, and let's see which one might work. Here we go. A. Also, he was the first Canadian to walk in space. Okay, so we do see the mention of space, but what about his music? Yes, okay, first Canadian, I guess, you know, it, it really just mentions that he's a Canadian astronaut, like one time in the beginning. So coming back and tackling his Canadianness, I mean, I don't think that this is a very strong answer. It's the first one I've read, so it's the best one I have but I don't think it's the strongest one that I might see. But let's see, B. Surprisingly, Hadfield is actually a talented musician who, before this, went viral with a cover of David Bowie's Space Oddity. Okay, so what do we see here? Talking about Hadfield, music career, went viral with a cover of David Bowie's Space Oddity. Space, Hadfield, music. Boom, all three together in one sentence. This also adds on from the previous sentence talking about his album that he uh, recorded in space. And then boom, we're also talking again a little more about the music that he's done. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Right now, that's my strongest answer. Let's see if C or D are any, you know, a better of a fit. Let's find out. C, as of now, Hadfield has no plans of returning to space. So Hadfield, space, but this whole text here is about music. It's about music. There's no mention about music here. Nothing about music, so I'm gonna take that out. A is no longer a strong answer to me either. Let's check out D here. So D, on February 9th, 2021, Virgin Galactic announced that Hatfield would be joining their space advisory board. Where are we talking about music here? There's no mention of music. So with that, nah, I like B. B is going to be the correct answer. That's my strongest answer for sure. Because again, the main idea here was talking about Hadfield's space and music career. Only one of these talks in depth, a little more in depth about his music career and still includes Hadfield in space. Booyah. I like it right there. And so with that said, that is your example for next sentence. Let's keep it moving forward here and let's talk about tone. I'll see you in a second. So here's another big one. Tone questions. So what's a tone question? 
A tone question pretty much is measuring your ability to identify kind of the mood or style of the text. So remember this, when it comes to tone, you're not exactly picking apart the words and the information that's being given. You're really picking apart the way the information is being presented. So one more time, it's not about, again, the information within the passage. It's about the way it's being presented. Is the information being presented in an informal way? Is it conversational? Is it informative or explanatory? Is the passage kind of uh, conversating with, you know, what, what are we getting from this passage? You know, who's the audience? Who is the passage speaking to? You know, those are the things you really want to consider to have the best shot at getting a tone question correct. So as always, read the question first to first get that you are dealing with a tone question. You got to make sure you do that. And then from there, go straight to the passage. So with tone questions, the choices for the answers are typically going to be very, very, very short. One word or two, maybe. And so what you want to do is go straight to the passage. Don't read the answers first. Get your own idea of what the tone might be. Don't get tricked by the choices. Now, it's not always necessary to do this. You can look at the answers every now and then, depending on the question, but I wouldn't risk it. Start with the passage, get your own opinion on what the tone is, and then go to the choices and see what you have. So again, what you're doing is you're trying to find the mood, style, and audience. That's what you want to keep in mind as you really read through things. And so let's go ahead and check out an example here. Let's keep moving forward. Tone, here we go. So in 1995, oh, did I confirm it's a tone question? No. Now I know it's a tone question. Sounds good. So with that said, let's go ahead and get to it here. In 1995, researchers reported being able to train pigeons to discriminate between Monet and Picasso paintings. Some research, okay. You train pigeons to discriminate between paintings of different artists? That's crazy. So when Picasso images were inverted, the birds could still tell it was a Picasso. When the images were upside down, it would derange the bird's judgment. Okay, so you can read it again if you'd like to. Again, keeping in mind, well, who's the audience? What are we kind of, uh, kind of, how are we expressing this information? Is it conversational? Is it formal, informative, informal? What are we looking at? So again, researchers reported being able to train pigeons to discriminate between these two artist paintings. When the Picasso images were inverted, the birds could still tell. When it was upside down, it would derange their judgments. So, is this conversational? No. Is this, uh, it seems like this is just really giving information. We have a date here. Here's what researchers found. Here's what was, was, was also found. And then here's what was also found when they did this. This is pretty informative. This is pretty, uh, I guess I would say that they are just stating facts, essentially, and the reasons and, and things that happened. So if we look at the tones here, we have optimistic. Optimistic means hopeful. Is there any hope here? Are we talking about a bad situation that can get better? No, we're not. We are not. Is this critical? Are we judging here? Are we you know, criticizing or, 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 or really you know, picking something apart here? Not really. It looks like they're just talking about a research and what happened within that experiment or the experiments. So I wouldn't say this is critical either. Is this colorful? No. What does colorful even mean? You know, it would mean, hey, we're using a bunch of great and, and, and really expansive words, you know, and I don't see that here. It looks like we're explaining what happened in this experiment. In 1995, this is what happened. Here's some of the results. Here's some more results. They are explaining what happened in these events. There you go. So again, it's not about what the information is, it's about how it's presented. That's what makes up tone the right way. And so coming up next, we've got quote questions. Quote questions, um, they can be definitely tough as well. They're gonna be handled the same way. So let's go ahead, dive on in, let's get to it. And before we continue, given how complicated paragraph comprehension might be in terms of all the different types of questions and all the different types of paragraphs that you can read, it's important to access our paragraph comprehension bootcamp course that's going to have all the problems you could ever need to work with. And on top of that, you'll have recorded lessons in there to help work with you step by step and see these strategies play out every single time. Check out the paragraph comprehension bootcamp as part of our ASVAB all access program. 
last but not least, we've got quote questions. So quote questions, again, arguably are gonna be pretty tough for a lot of folks because the quote questions, they're gonna give you a quote, you know, some sort of take from some passage or they're gonna give you a phrase or an idiom or something like that. And the problem with a lot of people who are taking the paragraph comprehension is that, well, we tend to kind of literally interpret what we're reading. So for example, the early bird gets the worm. Okay, the early bird gets the worm. Are we literally talking about a bird waking up early to get a worm? No, that's a metaphor. What we're saying is, you know, if you get things done early, you will most likely eat. You will most likely prosper if you get things done earlier. We're not talking about getting up on, you know, at, at dawn or before that. We're just saying the early bird gets the worm. If you are there on time or earlier than that, you are more likely to succeed. That's what that means. And so again, it's not a literal interpretation. We're not calling you a bird and we're, only, we're not only applying this to birds. And so that's where quote questions again can trick a lot of people. So let's get to it here. Tips here. Again, read the question first. I sound like a broken record, but it is so true. So true. Up next, go straight to the passage. Do not ever read the choices first for quote questions. They are designed to trick you. These quote questions will seem like they're a very good fit. And because of that, you know, those, those choices, if they all seem like they're a good fit, that's how you get stuck in this little swirl of confusion. Like it could be A, it could be B, it could be C. And that's how you get tricked. That's exactly how you get tricked. I don't want you to get tricked, okay? So make sure again, go straight to the passage. Straight to the passage, okay? Next up, read the passage again and again and again until you get your own meaning of the quote. Don't rely on the choices. Read it until you get your own meaning and then pick the choice that really aligns with what you believe, all right? If you don't do it that way, it's gonna be mighty tough. And so then lastly, Remember that the answer is uh, the answer is not likely to be a literal translation. Again, the correct answer is not going to say exactly what the quote said. It might be another way of saying it. It might be how it applies to the real world. It really depends. But you cannot you cannot believe that this is going to be a literal interpretation all the way through. And so, all you need to do here is go ahead and follow my lead here. We're gonna go ahead and try an example right now. So here we go, right here. Here's an example of a quote question. And again, we know we're dealing with a quote question because it says, what does Hemingway mean? Okay, what does Hemingway mean? Okay, cool. We know that this is a quote question because we have quotations right there. So here we go, let's read it. There is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Okay, sounds good. There is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at the typewriter and bleed. Okay. Okay, let's think about it. What's going on here? There is nothing to writing. Okay, basically this first sentence here means writing is simple. That's what the author seems to be saying. There's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. So they're basically saying it's easy. And then here it says, all you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. What? If it's so easy, all you need to do is bleed for it? That doesn't sound easy at all. So this is your first hint here that this is being sarcastic. That's sarcasm right there. That is sarcasm. There's nothing to it. All you gotta do is sit down and bleed. That sounds like the person's being sarcastic, right? Oh yeah, making a million dollars is easy. All you gotta do is sell your life, sell your soul, right? That sounds sarcastic. Yeah, man. Yeah, man, you can, have, you can have anything you want in the world. All you got to do is, uh, you know, live in a cave and, you know, do nothing but work for 100 years. But yeah, you'll get it. Yeah. So again, sarcasm here. You got to be able to sort through that and, and see that there. Next up. Again, so they're being sarcastic. Writing is not easy. Writing is hard. That's what's being said here. And all you need to do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Sit down at a typewriter and bleed. But what do you mean by that? You know, in terms of, yeah, bleeding isn't an easy thing, but what do you mean bleed? What do you mean? Oh, if we're talking about writing, ink, bleed, you're basically giving your all to it. That's what it sounds like here. Again, if you're talking about writing with ink being involved, 
the blood is the actual ink. That's what this person is implying. Ernest Hemingway, that's what Ernest is saying in this sense here. You need to kind of give yourself to it. You need to get, give yourself, you, you need to be put into your work. You need to put all of yourself into it. So writing is hard because you need to put everything you got into it. That's what I got from this. So now I'm gonna go through the answer choices and see which one of these backs up what I just said. Writing isn't easy. You gotta pour your blood and tears and sweat into it. So, A, writing is simple. If all you read was the first sentence, then I could see how you could pick A. B, here we go. Use your blood as the ink for your writing. No, <laughs> no, that is not worth saying. You just, it, what, what Ernest Hemingway is saying is, you know, not to literally, you know, bleed your way into the writing, no. You're basically giving blood, sweat, and tears. That's the implication there. And I'm sure you've heard that before, right? And my sweat, my blood, and tears. I, I have given everything I got into this. I think we've heard that before. C, your writing should come from the heart. And D, writing is a noble task. Your writing should come from the heart. You need to give everything you've got. Blood, sweat, and tears into your work. That sounds like pretty close to what I just said, right? That's pretty close. I like C. Uh, writing is a noble task. No, I mean, what do you mean by noble? You know, noble means for the benefit of others. You know, giving more than what you get. That's what I would consider noble. Uh, nothing here really describes writing being something that's selfless. Giving to uh, no, it's it's writing. It's art. So two different conversations there. D wouldn't work. So with that said, C is the answer. So I hope you see that there, my party people. Again. Quote questions, they can be pretty tricky, pretty dang tricky. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move forward here and we are going to recap this. So stay tuned here. Let's recap everything that we just went over. That way we have the best shot of practicing and studying the right way, moving forward. All right, so hopefully you've enjoyed everything up to this point. Let's go ahead and recap everything so that way you have a good shot moving forward, of practicing the right way. So again, here's some things. Inferencing factual questions again, this is about finding the answer that's best supported by the passage. There are those exception questions that will have you pick the answer that's not supported by the passage. So we do definitely want to go ahead and keep this in mind here. This is the most common type of question. So let's make sure we understand that right there too. About, again, half of your questions will be inferencing factual. About half. Maybe even more. Next up, we have sequence of events. Remember with sequence of events, we go ahead and start with the answer choices. Because again, it's about ordering, it's a logical process. And so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and look at those choices, find the one that happens first, and keep eliminating our way to the right answer. After that, we have next sentence questions, which are a little more subjective. But remember, it's about basically making sure that the next sentence follows up from the previous sentence, and also still captures the tone and the main idea of the passage. Again, those are things you wanna think about, and you need to practice discovering main idea and tone to get next sentence down easier. Next up, we've got ourselves uh, tone over here. Again, tone is about the vibe, the mood, the style, the audience of that passage. So mood, style, and audience, those are the three things you really wanna consider there. And number four, or last one here, number five, quote, find the one answer that best represents your understanding of the quote. Don't go to those choices first. Read the quote as many times as you need to get your interpretation, and then move forward the right way. All right, so next, remember, simple things. Always read the question first. You wanna understand what you're walking into. You know, it's great that you're reading a passage about a ficus or a passage about the blue whale or a passage about space, but if you know why you're reading that passage from the get-go, it gives yourself a great advantage moving forward. You take less time and you get more confidence answering that question. Next up, Remember, with these types of questions, go straight to the passage. Next sentence, tone and quote, you go straight to the passage. Everything else, you can go ahead and kind of, you know, do your thing with sequence of events, answer choices first, inferencing factual, it depends. You can go either way, just fine. Now, lastly, how can you raise your score? How can you raise your score? So the thing is about raising your score, you know, you can do it plenty of different ways. But reading is the best way to do it. And so these are three free apps that you can use, Hoopla, LibriVox, and Loyal Books. Um, definitely, 
uh, three main ways you can do this. The Hoopla, it provides free books with a, li with a public library card. Uh, LibriVox is a free audiobook app and Loyal Books, free audiobooks and ebooks app. So feel free to look those up. Now, if you want something a little more specific to the ASVAB, we do have a free practice test with video solutions. That way you can learn from every mistake and move forward the right way. So make sure that if you're not in there already, get my free practice test with video solutions. And if you've already tried it out and you've enjoyed it, then it's up to you now to get the ASVAB All Access Program. In case you didn't know about the program, long story short, I support you all the way until you pass by providing you with the ability to text me when you need help. I give you access to all of my classes and recordings. And on top of that, you get access to over 2,500 practice questions with video solutions to math topics, with video solutions coming up for paragraph comprehension, and everything else that you need to work on for the ASVAB. And so, with that said, gang, I am Anderson, your ASVAB coach. It has been such a pleasure making sure that you have everything you need to get started with paragraph comprehension the right way. And I'm always thankful for you guys supporting me, this channel, my company, and the website. And so, with that said, let's keep raising our scores so we can get that job we deserve. Keep pushing forward, and if you have any questions, here is my phone number. Again, I'm Coach Anderson. Go ahead and reach out to me. Say, hey coach, I just finished watching your paragraph comprehension lesson. I'd love to learn more about the free practice test or the program. Let me know, that way I can help you sort through that and get the things you need to get the job you want. With that said, again, I'm Coach Anderson. Let's ace the ASVAB, and I'll see you in the next video. As always, thank you for watching our YouTube videos. If you want to give it a like, or if you want to hit the subscribe button, that'd be amazing. And if you'd like to join our full program for a full week for free, no credit card required, go ahead and follow those directions right over there, or scan that QR code to get started. Follow those directions, and let's start acing the ASVAB. Coach Anderson out. I'll see you next time.